All right, uh, Elise Jones here. We're gonna call to order the May 10th uh, meeting of the RTD Accountability Committee. Welcome everyone on this very uh, lush and wet spring morning. We all being from Colorado have to be happy about moisture, even if it is a little dreary for Monday. Um, I'm gonna start us off with public comment to see if there's anybody that would like to share with us for up to three minutes. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, if you could just raise your hand, proverbial, you know, in the uh, Zoom context, and we will open up the recording if there's anybody. Melinda, do you see any takers for public comment? Uh, yes, I do. Um, it looks like the first person we had was Molly McKinley. And I will go ahead and allow her to speak. And then Molly, you'll just need to unmute yourself on your end and you have three minutes and you have the floor. Great, thanks. Good morning and thank you for holding this space for public comment. My name is Molly McKinley and I'm here on behalf of the Denver Streets Partnership. I'd like to give a comment today in support of their recommendations on streamlining fares, passes and services that has been brought forward by the operations subcommittee. We're excited to see this recommendation for a few reasons. First, we know that RTD's fares are some of the highest in the country, disproportionately burdening low-income community members who need access to transit the most. Free transit service for equity populations ensures that those who are most susceptible to dramatic changes in fares have continuous reliable access to transit. As housing and transportation are two top household costs, equity populations are already carrying the heavy burden of increasing housing costs in this area and offering free transit service is a meaningful action that RTD can take to help alleviate that financial pressure. Next, both the state of Colorado and the city of Denver have ambitious climate goals. Transportation is a top contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, so we must increase access to public transit through whatever avenues we can. Denver's Climate Action Task Force recommended that free public transit be provided to equity populations in order to meet our climate goals and reach those who can benefit from free transit the most. This is the type of thing that could be paid for at least in part through Denver's recently established Climate Protection Fund and is an expense that other municipalities could consider prioritizing in their budgets as well. Lastly, we think these changes could help increase ridership, not only among people who already use transit, but would use it more often if it were free, but also among those who would use transit but are kind of intimidated and unsure how to navigate the current path structure. We should be doing everything we can to make it simple and convenient to ride transit. So it becomes the obvious choice for getting around if we're going to increase ridership in a significant way. And simplifying the path structure is one way of doing that. Thank you for your time this morning, and I hope you will support the recommendations of the operations subcommittee. Thank you, Ms. McKinley. Melinda, who's next? All right, next up, it looks like we have Tina McDonald. So Tina, I will unmute you now, and then you'll just need to unmute on your end. Uh, interesting. It's not allowing me to unmute Tina. Um, very strange. Um, Tina, I apologize. For some reason on my end, it's not allowing me to unmute you. Um, Melinda? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Maybe ask Tina, well, I guess I can, ask Tina this, to um, sign off and then sign back in and see if that works and and we can move forward. And when she gets back in, we'll we'll allow her time yep. for comment. That would have been my suggestion. So Tina, obviously if you can log out and then come back in, we'll allow you to make your public comment. Very much apologize for the inconvenience. Um, okay, looks like she was able to hear us, so. Uh, at this time, I don't see any other hands raised, Madam Co-Chair. So do we wanna wait a second for her to um, get back in? I would leave that to you. <laughs> okay, well, well, we'll have, we'll, well, I, actually, why don't I ask members of the committee if they've had a chance to view the uh, April 12th committee meeting summary 
while we wait for her to come back in and then we'll circle back to her comments. Did anybody have any comments or suggested uh, corrections to the April 12th meeting summary? Looks good to everybody. Okay, I'm taking that as a thumbs up on that item. And um, why don't I, uh, why don't we do the co-chair update while we continue waiting? Um, let me ask my co-chair, Crystal, if she had anything to report from her end. I don't have any reports. So, great. Um, I had just had a quick one, which is that the RTD Accountability Committee inspired bill, House Bill 1186, um, went through Senate um, Committee and uh, Lynn and I testified again, Deborah, Deborah was present as well, passed through that, passed the Senate and is waiting for the governor's signature. I have not heard any uh, details about whether or not he's gonna do a signing ceremony or not, but um, I don't know if anybody else has any info on that, Lynn. Do you know? I just know that um, Senator Bridges asked for a signing ceremony and uh, they sent something out asking about who should be invited. Um, I hope you got some of that. I assume they're inviting the accountability committee, but I haven't heard for sure that they're having it or when it is. Okay. But we should all feel good that um, our, our good work made it through the uh, legislative gauntlet. And uh, I did speak with the governor and he is pleased with the bill and sees that it's an important first step to creating flexibility. So I think we'll get it signed. Rhett? You know, the uh, meeting that we held with uh, the sponsors of the bill uh, when someone was proposing an amendment, oh. do you know uh, if anything happened with that? Hopefully um, not. <laughs> I think the sponsor, legislative sponsors felt like um, that there didn't need to be any changes in legislation um, we did meet with Greer, what's Greer's last name, um, who had some questions and concerns about whether or not there was going to be any competition with um, local businesses near RTD proper, RTD's property, um, whether or not RTD would give a competitive advantage, for example, to a concessionaire on their property. And I think the, there was the, quite a few of us on that call. And I, I think there was, while we appreciated hearing those concerns, felt like it was... Um, not going to be uh, the problem that um, he felt like it was going to be. So I, I, there were no um, amendments made. So that was the right decision. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I appreciate it, obviously, anybody coming forward to, to work through those issues. But I think RTD's comments, I think, were helpful and should, should have been comforting that that scenario was not likely to, to come to pass. That was all I had for my update, unless anybody had any color to add to those items. If not, um, Melinda, were we successful in getting Tina unmuted? We were, so Tina is back. Uh, Tina, you'll just need to unmute on your end and you'll have three minutes for public comment. Hi, um, my name is Tina McDonald and I'm a advocate a uh, non-attorney advocate for the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Um, I've been dealing in transit issues with RTD for six years now. And I have some concerns in regards to the um, cooperation effort that RTD is having uh, or just started with Uber. And those, those concerns uh, revolve around two things. One is um, we've had problems in the past with RTD's uh, use of uh, taxis in regards to um, dealing with people who have mobility devices and assistance dogs uh, in drivers refusing to take those pe people. Um, Uber is now, as an RTD contractor, subject to the same rules um, that RTD is in terms of those things. So need to make sure that that's well communicated with Uber. Second thing is security. 
Um, disabled women are twice as likely to be raped um, than women without disabilities. Uh, unfortunately, that rate skyrockets when we're talking with about people with intellectual disabilities. 90% of women who have intellectually disabilities are raped 10 or more times during their lifetime. We're concerned, or at least I'm very concerned with the lack of uh, fingerprint uh, background checks. You have background checks. I'm well aware that um, background checks can be biased in terms of people with, uh, can be racially biased. But I used to live in a complex where they did a security check and lo and behold, the person who lived above me had been in a prison gang and had murdered three people. He got into the affordable housing complex by taking someone else's identity. So concerned about safety, uh, sexual assaults, violence, uh, DUIs, DWIs, and uh, just in, and also the safety of the vehicles involved. We've had in the past problems with, or in this city with Freedom Taxi, uh, where 90% of the taxis that, that they'd had on the road were not, um, not in good working order, in dangerous conditions. So my main concern is security and also making sure that, that people with disabilities who this program is supposed to help aren't being discriminated against in terms of uh, guide dogs and uh, mobility devices that can be folded up and put into a car that we've had problems in the past um, with, that, with taxi companies in the excessive ride program uh, refusing to, to deal with. Ms. McDonald, thank you so much for bringing those important concerns to our attention. And I'm gonna um, see if RTD would like to respond at all to um, any of the issues you raised. So Madam Chair, if I may, this is Deborah Johnson, General Manager and CEO. And uh, Ms. McDonald, thank you for your comments, just for everyone's edification. I have a recurring meeting that I'm holding on a monthly basis that involves Ms. McDonald along with Ms. Trustman and a couple other members from the disability communities. These issues have been brought to our attention. A member of my team, um, uh, Michael Ford, who works as our chief operating officer, as both Ms. McDonald and Ms. Trustman know, we are working through these issues with them as they provided us with information and members of the team are working this through, recognizing some of the elements that have been posed relative to having uh, drop, uh, operators or drivers from a contractor. We're cognizant of the concerns, as I said, we're working through. So Ms. McDonald, I don't know if you'd like to opine on what we're doing thus far, but I don't want anybody to think that this has fallen upon deaf ears because we are working collaboratively and cooperatively to address the concerns. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Belinda's General Manager, excuse me. Thank Go ahead. you, General Manager Johnson, for, for recognizing that we are meeting with you and I appreciate that so much. I do believe we are doing good work and that has a lot to do with, with your willingness to hear us. I appreciate that very, very much. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kristen. Melinda, is there anybody else who would like to speak to us today? I do not see any other hands raised at this time. 
All right. Well, then, thank you um, for your public comment, and we will move on to RTD's update. So I will turn the floor back to uh, Deborah Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. First and foremost, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. I'm going to have Doug McLeod give an update, and then I will provide comments thereafter. Doug, take it away if you're unmuted. Looks like you're still muted. Good morning. This is Doug McLeod. Apologize for that. Um, I just got connected with uh, the audio settings. So thank you for that. Um, so good morning. Happy Monday. Yes, uh, for an update on our financial um, status as well as the uh, draws on the CARES, CRISA, and ARPA funding. So as the committee is aware, we did draw down the uh, $232 million CARES funding in 2020 to sustain operations. Um, we have not yet begun to draw down um, the uh, CRISA funding, which is $203 million. That, was, that grant was executed just two weeks ago on Monday. Um, we finished closing out our expenses through March and uh, intend to start drawing that shortly in the next couple of weeks. Um, what we would do is go back to uh, January of this year and start drawing based on our monthly expenses. Uh, we plan to use the same expenditures that we drew the CARES funding. So uh, essentially salaries and wages, and then purchase transportation, which is the cost of our contracted services with uh, fixed route bus, as well as fixed route um, commuter rail. So that is the plan going forward on the CRISA funding. We also had designated 180 million of that $203 million to be used to sustain operations as our um, revenues remain fairly low compared to where they were. Um, we would uh, stretch that 180 million. So 90% of the CRISA funding would be stretched over the next six run boards starting in June. So that would take us through May, uh, two years from now. Um, and then uh, we are still awaiting guidance on the ARPA funding, which is another $348 million, but anticipate that that funding would be used for the same purposes or designated by the FTA for the same purposes. And I believe General Manager Johnson has uh, additional comments based on our conversations with the FTA. So thank you. So thank you very much, Mr. McLeod and Madam Chair, if I may. As we go forward in reference to these relief funds that we have received, um, recognizing that our comments, I will admit, have been somewhat vague. We have yet to receive specific guidance relative to what it is that we can do. And with that being said, I have a standing meeting with the FTA Regional Administrator of Region 8, of which Colorado is a member. And with that being said, just on Thursday, I'd ask, uh, as it pertains to a timeline relative to us garnering a better understanding of what we can do with ARPA funds. And uh, Friday evening at five o'clock, I received an email uh, stating that uh, FTA has not published any formal ARPA guidance yet. And I have asked specifically what that may be. The reason why it's important for us to have this information readily available, recognizing that Mr. McLeod spoke about the money that we have yet to draw down on as it relates to CRISA, because that um, um, Oh, it's, uh, award was just made to us two weeks ago. It stipulates that it's for fuel, for um, salaries, utilities, and for operations. Recognizing that we did not know we were gonna receive this money, we have budgeted line items to make up for that shortfall in relationship to uh, the number of staff that we thought we would have readily available in early January. That's an important nuance due to the fact that we, if we're gonna leverage any monies for other items, we have to make sure that we have those funds in which we receive from Carissa can be reimbursable so then we can allocate monies in other areas. As Doug mentioned, we don't have that information at this time. Recognizing that the money primarily is for service delivery and more so as we look to make changes relative to our um, service allocations, what we are doing is using our uh, service equity analysis for the COVID-19 reductions that were made back in April 2020 as a guidepost, ensuring that we're using that to provide services to those equity areas um, that may have been impacted. And that is how we're going to chart the course going forward. Recognizing also that there's a myriad of other positions in which we need to reinstate um, not just operators and mechanics, there's a myriad of other positions that are paramount to us delivering service. 
So we are more than willing to provide updates as we go forward and we get this information from the federal government so we can garner a better understanding of what we can leverage uh, as, a, as I would say, as a funding swap. So happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks. Thank you for that. Questions for RTD on spending? I guess I, I have some. I, I appreciate that um, your response has to be somewhat vague because you haven't received official guidance, but um, the, the concern of the committee is that we have spent, it <laughs> feels like a long time putting together recommendations um, for RTD and um, some of them, particularly our work around fares and passes, um, are ripe for um, more immediate implementation, you know, sort of the six month pilot program that we're suggesting to jumpstart ridership um, and to test some of these ideas, the partnerships. Um, you had in indicated, RTD had indicated in prior um, discussions on this that a small amount would be set aside for the committee's recommendations and the audits, the auditor's um, report recommendations, a relatively small amount. Since then, there's been another tranche of unexpected federal um, rescue funds. And I guess this committee is looking for some assertion that a, a meaningful amount of money from this unexpected federal funds will be put towards um, implementing some of our recommendations, which are designed to, to really um, restore and help RTD recover from the from COVID in a way that will then have a ripple effect on the agency's finances. And so far have not, don't have a whole lot of um, assurances that indeed any of this money is going to be put towards the recommendations that we've been working on. So can you talk a little bit more about what we can expect and hope for with regards to that? Yeah, so thank you very much. That's a very um, good question and a fair one at that. So recognizing that there have been recommendations put forward relative to fares and as you qualify jumpstarting ridership, I do need to manage expectations as reading through the minutes, you have an understanding that we are leveraging a fair study and equity analysis. And while it is, uh, while it is permissible within the FTA guidance, that there can be a six month pilot program where there's an exemption, I need to let everybody know that once you do a six month pilot program, until there's a fair study and equity analysis that returns back to what it was previously. And so having had conversations with the FTA relative to us not having done a fair study and equity analysis since 2015, while we could pursue that, it's not recommended by the Federal Transit Administration for us to do that in the absence of having a fair study and equity analysis in, in reference to managing expectations and perhaps um, causing uh, disproportionate burdens and disparate impacts to certain populations. Now, as we go forward and we leverage this, um, leverage this, there is an understanding that yes, we do need to address our fair program. So I say that to say that while we could leverage a six month pilot program, it's not recommended. Um, by the FTA. And what I would like to do is really look at fares holistically so we can make some permanent, meaningful um, changes. However, with that as a backdrop, there may be something that we can do in the interim period, um, but we'd have to assess that as we go forward with the FTA. So it sounds like we're headed to a no. <laughs> On, on that. We haven't quite finished our recommendations. That'll come later in this meeting, but I guess um, I, I, I would like to push back a little bit on that in terms of we are in a unique and unprecedented, us a unprecedented point in time with this COVID pandemic where ridership has been hit very, very low. We need to reintroduce people to the safety and convenience of transit, and we're going to need to do something. And again, I use the word jumpstart for lack of a better term, um, recognizing that that particular program is not necessarily going to be something that can be continued forever and without, certainly not without study, which you're, mm -hmm. which you are initiating, but that, I, that there would likely be a collective understanding that a pilot program it is, is going to, um, you know, it's like a sale. It's not necessarily gonna be 
the same price that low forever, but enough to get people to, to um, feel comfortable and safe and uh, to ride the bus and the, the rail again. And I, knew, I don't wanna be the only voice here on the committee expressing this, but I guess I'm, I just wanna express some concern that it feels like this committee's good work is gonna be for naught. Rhett? Yeah, I just wanna second that. And I, I also uh, wanna know whether this fair study and analysis or fair study and analysis, fair, fair, whatever, can be paid for out of those, out of those funds that you'll be receiving uh, uh, the, the additional uh, funding from. I mean, if, if it's something you have to do in order to be able to modify your fares program, then why isn't a study like that on the agenda for RTD? Uh, sir, uh, just for clarification, the fair study and equity analysis is on our books. We cannot utilize the monies for Carissa for said study. However, what I'm saying to all of you, and I think there's something lost in translation, we can do a six month pilot. I'm saying it comes around to managing expectations because basically from my understanding, with my experience and from being here as well, when we've done these things and some of them preceded me, it's memories are short. I'm not saying that we can't do it. So when you said, Madam Chair Jones, that it sounds like a no, I didn't say no. I said, as we go forward, there is an expectation that this would go longer than six months. Case in point, as I did my due diligence and read through documents, there has been pilot programs previously um, with me coming into this agency just a couple of months ago, I leveraged a, a pilot program with the Aurora campus. And even in our documents where it said we couldn't exceed six months due to the fact of the Civil Rights Act of 64, Title VI, sometimes memories are short. So I recognize what you're saying. It will take a collective effort to manage expectations because even though we say that going forward, there oftentimes is something, and I've gotten a myriad of different questions from a myriad of different stakeholders saying, can't you extend this? And the answer would be, no, I don't have it within my jurisdiction to extend it because it's federal law. And so in the sense of doing a fair study and equity analysis, we're looking at it from a system-wide approach to make informed decisions, recognizing that our fares are substantially high, recognizing that we do want to spawn ridership. However, ridership is, you know, some element of activity and what is our end goal as we look to increasing um, an understanding of a growth ridership plan. And so all I'm doing is trying to manage everyone's expectations. And so it's unfortunate if you think that I'm being a naysayer in all of this, because this is something that is very important to me, especially from an equity standpoint. So I just want everybody on the committee to recognize that I am placed in a precarious position, recognizing I came into this organization and, and the manner in which pilot programs have been utilized may not have been the way in which FTA intended them to be utilized, whether that's good, bad, or indifferent. I'm trying to level set um, the facts that we have and look at the playing field so it's a benefit to the greater region holistically. And it's gonna take some time longer than I anticipated recognizing that we haven't had a data set that included census data um, since 2015. And this information has to be within a five year time period in which to utilize. I, I appreciate that. And I know how challenging your job is. I, it must be tough walking into, uh, into so many different issues that are, that are uh, in need of attention, I guess is the way to put it. But I just want to know about the fair study and equity analysis okay. that you have to do in order to be able to do a more extensive pilot. Is that a major thing to, to have to do? Does it cost a lot of money? Um, what, what would prevent you from being able, does it have to be done after the pilot or I, I don't understand how that works. Okay. Thank you. That's very, no, 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 that's a very fair question. And I appreciate you asking. So yes. So anytime pursuant to the FTA circular guidance that's based on, you know, federal law, it states that there is an exemption pursuant to their guidance where you can do a six month pilot. And it's called like a promotional fair or something of that sort, right? In reference to speaking off the top of my head, not having the, the circular directly in front of me. And in order to make any such thing 
permanent, you have to do an equity analysis to ensure that there is not a disproportionate burden or disparate impact on low minor, sorry, minority populations or low income populations, right? And so nothing can be permanent until that is done. But you have to use a data set that is within five years old. So when there were changes done, I believe in 2018, and, and Doug, uh, yes, she's nodding. That was used from a data set that was done in 2015. We are now in 2021. Our data set is more than six years old. Hence, we can't use that. And that's what I found out coming into the organization. When I came before you, I came before you in earnest. I had no idea that our data set was that old. So we have to start and get a new data set. And what I mean by that is look at um, American Community Survey census data, look at um, a look at the population and all these different elements. And that's what we're embarking upon now. And it's going to be a very in-depth, comprehensive analysis of which we haven't done in that in this magnitude before, looking at uh, LEP, limited English proficient um, populations, looking at the 21 safe harbor languages, recognizing that we want to leverage multicultural organizations to help us get to those populations that are speaking those safe harbor languages. So it will be in depth. We're saying it could be 18 months. We're kicking it off very shortly. It could be less than that. But in an effort to manage expectations, recognizing that we don't know what we don't know, I'm being quite judicious in reference to managing all these expectations, recognizing that we've come out with pilots and then they haven't materialized uh, to some permanency status due to the fact that what happens is after we do a fair study and equity analysis, any recommendations we take has to go forward to our policy body as stipulated in the FTA circular. So there's all these steps. That's why it's an 18 month time frame. Thank you, CEO Johnson. You're welcome. Very Thank you. I see Rebecca White has her hand up. Rebecca? Yeah, thank you. I think that last interaction um, answered my question. I was just going to ask what the time frame was for that study and if there's any way that could happen at the same time that the pilot was. Um, but it, it sounds like uh, there's uh, very little uh, opportunity to do a six month study. Okay. The pilot can dovetail, Rebecca, just for clarity, in the sense as long as our fair study and equity analysis is completed prior uh, to implementing any six month pilot. I, I do wonder though, to Elisa's point um, in managing public expectations, I, which I totally understand, we have the, the same issue when we um, open express lanes for free in a sort of a pilot phase and then turn the toll on. But it seems like with quite a bit of marketing, just note, noting to the public that you are inviting, you're inviting Colorado back to, to ride transit, that there would be some understanding that when that six months was up, that that was indeed kind of the end of this welcome back period. It just seems like COVID provides a little bit more opportunity to manage expectations, but. And you know what, we can collaborate on that and I'm willing to try something, I'm just saying, you know, my past couple of months and, you know, um, uh, Director Whitmore knows this and, you know, City Council Member Mullica and so forth as I've come in and we were looking at the inline fares and I had to go tell people, I'm sorry, we can't do this because it was sort of, you know, disheartening um, because memories are short and it's like, we have this, we have this, we have this. And so while I'm open to it, there's inevitably always going to be some faction that doesn't recall it was six months and can't you do something beyond that? So that's all I'm putting out there. Not saying it can't be done, but there's going to be a lot of people that feel a little deflated. Once again, that RTD says you were doing this and then it comes back as if we were being disingenuous. And that's my concern. So I see um, Julie and then Crystal and then Troy. Yeah, and so I just wanted to throw in our personal experience up here with the end line with the promotional fair program that we had for six months um, when the end line opened. And, you know, it was, I, I think that there was some miscommunication or some misunderstanding about 
the equity analysis and when that was going to start. We were hoping that, you know, uh, the work would be done during the, the, the promotional period. And then hopefully there wasn't going to be that much time in between the two and it didn't work out that way. So now we're stuck with just increased fares and frustrated people um, and frustrated electeds, which isn't helpful either. So I think we do have to be very careful about how we manage um, expectations around promotional fare um, periods because it's not, I, it's, it's just very difficult, I think, to manage um, people who have increased fares. You know, if you're used to having your fare really low and then it pops up, people get upset. Um, and, you know, it, it is what it is. It seems like this promotional or the, the equity analysis is this insurmountable barrier for us to be able to get the fares that our community needs. And so anything that we could do to support that process, to, to increase, you know, efforts, resources, whatever, to, to do this analysis as quickly, as efficiently, as effectively as possible is what is in the best interest of all of our communities. Um, this it just seems this is this is the, the goalpost we have to get past to, to actually be able to have transit that works for community um, at the fairs we need it to. So um, it, it is very frustrating. And so I, I would, I, I agree with D.O. Johnson on that, and, and we need to be very careful about how we manage um, any type of promotional fare moving forward. Thanks, Crystal, and then Troy, then Dea. Thanks, Elise, um, and thank you, Deborah, for um, elaborating it a little more. I'm, I'm hoping to, um, I guess, gain just a little more clarity um, with your support. Um, and it sounds like just to summarize what I've been hearing is that there's some structural pieces that are preventing us from moving forward. I know this committee is very motivated and you know really wanting to push the conversation around you know action. That's kind of the mm -hmm. nexus around accountability, right? So what are we creating accountability around and how are we taking action on that? And so I appreciate the committee's um, collective energy and wanting to pursue that. But what I'm hearing um, is that there may be, you know, some um, wiggle room maybe down the line, but there has to be some structural pieces in place, specifically around the, the data set um, in order, be, because that's federally mandated. Um, and uh, Deborah, I'll give you a chance to correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it sounds like that's, that, that there's just for whatever reason that that didn't happen prior. And, and it's not surprising that um, when an organization has new leadership that, you know, that it takes time to kind of um, understand all of the, the mechanics of how things work. And so I guess I'm not surprised to hear that, um, the, that there's kind of like a deeper understanding of some of the, the issues prior and that that's taking longer than expected. So for me, um, I, I understand how that can evolve. So it, there's some structural pieces that that 18 months is is kind of that first one if if um, if I'm understanding correctly and that's roughly the 18 months give or take how how you know not understanding the how challenging that could be um, and then after that there was an equity study as well and then a potential pilot can you um, correct me if I'm misunderstanding just the sequence of events. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. I appreciate the question, Co-Chair. Um, basically, what I'm talking about is we're doing a fair study and equity analysis. That's 18 months, give or take, in and of itself. And we're kicking off with that in July, right? We've apprised the board. I've been talking in reference uh, to communicating out you know, with the media and so forth. So we want to do some extensive outreach to understand people's pain points. We are going to let a request for a proposal whereby we'll do a solicitation, hopefully in the July, August timeframe. We put that out, hopefully get a myriad of different prospective proposers. And in turn, we'll, able, we'll be able to um, select one of those proposers to be our consultant that will undertake this for us as we go forward. So that's why the timeline is air quotes, 
iffy in reference to what we anticipate doing. So that will be conducted for all intents and purposes in 2022, hoping that we can award a contract in the November timeframe. And so that work will be underway where we're doing, you know, data collection, uh, looking at peer agencies across the country. And I know we use that a lot, but peer agencies in the sense that have optimal fare structures, looking at a, a broad swath of the service area where it's multi-jurisdictional and things of the like. So for all intents and purposes, since we have to have a fair equity analysis done prior to a six month pilot, potentially there could be a pilot that was let say, you know, in the January, February timeframe, because we would anticipate our fair study and equity analysis being done. We do have to take whatever recommendations we bring forward in reference to what we get from the study you know, to the board, because while the FTA specifies that there needs to be an equity analysis done, they don't dictate what our fair structure is. They're just trying to ensure that there is not any type of disproportionate burdens or disparate impacts. So that rests with our policy body to discern what that fair structure is. So that's where I was going as we talk about looking at our fares, which are cumbersome, that rests within our auspices, you know, to discern what might be practical because it gets back to, you know, economics, right? you know, it would garner more ridership if we had a lower price, potentially speaking, but there's a lot of other variables of which we need to assess. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. It's the 18 month is including the data as well as the equity assessment. So that that's helpful. I was thinking it was a separate process, which, you know, if everyone's like concerned about timeline was also even more, you know, it felt a little belabored, but that is some clarity that um, is helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Then Dea. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, my uh, input was just added by a number of panel members, including uh, uh, Deborah. I, I just wanted her to kind of walk through what our thought process was. So thanks to one of our co-chairs that happened. And I appreciate that, Deborah. And, um, you know, just echo um, Mayor Pro Tem's comments on the ending of the six months pilot on the end line is very frustrating that we couldn't continue it but i think it's been explained why we couldn't and um but i do want to just leave and maybe lynn wants to chime in i mean um we hear you and uh, you know our priorities are are flanging up i think with a lot of the recommendations uh that you all are making so um this this fair and equity study is extremely important because we know the cumbersome nature of of the fair structure and a number of other matters. So thank you all for uh, asking the questions to Deborah and others in a more succinct manner than I could. So I'll yield my time to either Lynn or, or on down to Dea. Thank you. Lynn, did you have anything you wanted to pipe in or should I just move on to Dea? I, you know, I'll just second that. I think that that uh, this explanation has been really good. Uh, I think we're all excited about the fair study and and <laughs> Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, the pilot, uh, I agree, I get it, you know, that, that moving forward soon is important um, uh, for, for bringing back our ridership. We're still at a, at a very low number, but I think with uh, some of the pilots, we have been feeling the sting. So I also um, appreciate you know, uh, Deborah Johnson's focus on uh, making sure we're at the right point to do that. So we're not bumping them back up and, and getting RTD and in even more hot water. I hope we can move forward with it. You know, I think it would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Uh, also, General Manager Johnson, just for the explanation and just the additional context. Um, I, I, I completely understand where you're coming from, <laughs> and there are several pushes and push pulls. I think from from a lot of folks in the region. I also, as I was listening to the conversation. Um, just want to echo what I heard, at least as Crystal's amazing explanation, that there are just some structural pieces that are kind of preventing us from moving forward. I, I guess a clarification or a request, um, 18 months is a really long time. And as with every government agency or quasi-government agency, everything seems to take about 18 to 24 months to complete. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, as we're coming out of COVID and as we are really looking to a more equitable recovery from COVID, 
18 months is just, it, it, it's a long time for someone that's already feeling um, the pressure and the, the, the frustrations of the fares being too high, but also reduced service. And so I'm just wondering, is there a way that we can shorten that period? Is there a way that we um, can work with RTD? And when I say re, we, I mean like the royal we, the, the folks that are around this table, but also um, those that we have in our own respective networks that are data experts. I, I would hate for us to continually recreate data and data sets. There's a lot of rich data and rich data partners in the Denver metro area. So I guess my question is how can we collectively help shorten that time frame so that we can get this moving forward um, in recognition that folks are feeling the pressure right now? Thank you very much for that question. And I'm glad to see our thinking is aligned um, because, of course, we went to the FTA, we actually went to um, the, we went to headquarters being in DC, because with any civil rights issue, you can't deal with the regional office, you go directly to Washington, DC. With that as a backdrop, the reason being it's taking longer than 18 months, because traditionally it wouldn't take 18 months, because basically we're in this unique situation, i.e. COVID. So when you're looking at a data set, we have to make sure it's representative. So there's an extended period of time as we look at bringing ridership back to discern whether or not this is a snapshot in time of what will be as we make decisions that could be um, implemented over, you know, a couple of years period in time per se. So if ridership comes back, you know, say for instance, in January timeframe, we're leveraging this, then it may not be 18 months. That's why I'm using the air quotes with that. So there's a lot of different factors and unknown variables that's outside of our control. And that's why it was very important that we, when I say we, we in the sense of being RTD, um, when I was having conversations with my team, I'm like, what are other transit agencies doing? This is not an anomaly for RTD. And as we look at it holistically, that's why we're getting guidance. That's why they issue guidance. That's why we had to do the service equity analysis on the route modifications that were made due to the COVID pandemic. All of this is evolving as we go forward. And there could be additional guidance that we receive relative to what's happening if, in fact, there is you know, a resurgence as it relates to building back better and people are utilizing the system. So 18 months is at the outset. I'm thinking that if things happen, it could be less than that because traditionally when I've done things of this magnitude before, it's been closer to a year. So there could be a rub in there. So that's what I would offer up to you. I see Dan has his hand up. I have some final comments and then we need to move on on our rather packed agenda. So Dan. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I think everybody wants to see ridership go up. I know we at RAFTA want to see ridership go up, but we are still facing capacity constraints on our buses, requires a lot of backup. Meanwhile, there appears to be kind of a nationwide shortage of of bus operators, uh, so we're finding it really difficult to recruit right now. So I think we need to be careful and not oversell uh, you know, free rides or discounted, heavily discounted rides and, and increase demand for the service until RTD is really ready to accommodate it. Um, I don't know when that will be. I don't know if that's three months from now, six months from now, um, a year from now, but uh, all these things have to work together. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, that, that what RTD is doing with respect to ridership, even if it were to make it free right now, is going to be something that's going to be done in isolation of what else is going on with COVID-19 in the economy. When it starts to come back, then I think you're just going to see ridership start to grow organically. Thanks, Dan. Um, I, I want to take the opportunity to go back and echo what Rutt said to uh... CEO Johnson about recognizing how difficult your job is. And I really appreciate your willingness to engage in a really frank and open discussion on tough issues like this one. So really do appreciate that. And uh, if I'm pushing hard, don't, uh, it's just um, out of a desire to really see um, the transit system recover in a robust fashion. And I think some of my comments were made in the, the construct of everything that we're seeing with regards to COVID recovery relief is time limited. You know, all of the extra money from the feds, it's not like you're going to get more after COVID's over. Right. This is just to help recovery. 
everything the state and local governments are doing are time limited and everybody recognizes that. So that was the spirit of, is there a COVID recovery fair um, relief that we can provide under the understanding like everything else related to COVID, it's about recovering from the pandemic, which hopefully won't last forever. Um, but it, but everybody would understand it's not ongoing. That said, I think we've had a pretty robust discussion of the various structural and other issues and timing issues around that. And um, in the interest of time, I'd like to move us along on the agenda. Like we sort of covered five and six all in one fell swoop. So I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair to, to lead us through the rest of the agenda. Thank so you, Elise. Number seven. Yes, thank you. Um, Alrighty, uh, thank you all for, for all of that input. So we are gonna move into subcommittee recommendation status reports. And I believe we are just handing that off to our different co-chairs. So um, Brett, you are first on my screen. Are you good to, to be number one? No, it's not a number one I particularly desire, but thank you, <laughs> Madam Co-Chair. Um, so, there are a number of recommendations that we have been working on. And I think after our last meeting, we're finally at a point where we're going to be able to move those forward to the main RTD uh, accountability committee. But uh, there, there are things like the, the uh, rail alignment, the Northwest rail alignment, uh, and, and uh, things in support of some of the uh, ideas and fairs, we've worked, uh, we've worked with operations pretty closely in a lot of that. Um, and, and basically, some of the things that come out of the legislation that we appear to have finally have got ready to be signed by the governor, uh, in terms of how you can use transit-oriented development strategies to really produce some income uh, for RTD that they otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Uh, and um, and partnering is another another big issue, um, and uh, the 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 other thing that we've really spent a lot of time on is uh, the idea of how the dashboard would work and how we could make that dashboard more understandable. And Rebecca White is the one that deserves most credit for this, but that is also something that has not been a finance committee uh, activity. It's been an, an activity that we've worked with operations and governance and everyone else on. So I think there'll be some final recommendations that we'll see soon with that. One of the bigger things though is Northwest Rail. It, it is such a, a tough nut to crack because the, the cost of that system relative to the number of riders is gonna make it tough to get any kind of federal financing on it. And I, you know, I have looked at RTD's finances late into the night and early into the morning, and I just can't see where the money is to be able to do that. And so I think when you look at, at the lowest cost way we can really deliver quality ridership, it keeps coming back to, to looking at uh, what the Flatiron Flyer was able to do. Uh, they actually were carrying twice as many people as the whole Northwest Rail was is planned to be able to support. And they were doing it for about a tenth the cost of what it would cost with Northwest Rail. And so I think there'll probably be some recommendations that come out of, uh, out of that research. And uh, uh, I, rec I, I, you know, looking at the numbers, I know what a tough time this is right now for RTD. And, and uh, I just wanna say that all of you who work for RTD or who serve RTD on the boards, uh, th there's gonna be a path out of this eventually. It's just gonna be hard to get there. That's it for me. Thank you, Rhett. And um, just wanna echo the, the collaboration between the subcommittees. I think that was very strategic and I'm really glad that that was something we um, kind of proactively did throughout this process. Cause it, you know, there, finance kind of touches all of the things. And you, I mean, you could argue similarly for other subcommittees as well. So I'm glad that we um, were able to continue to do that to come up with uh, some of these recommendations supporting kind of across subcommittees. Alrighty, um, next on my screen for subcommittee reports is Julie. Um, you can have the mic. 
Yeah, so um, we have two recommendations that are in the packet um, for today. Well, the partnership recommendations we worked on obviously collaboratively, um, but then we also have service area recommendations. Now, the idea around this conversation was, um, you know, how do we have a conversation about RTD service area? Obviously, it's very large. Uh, well, what are some things that we should consider around that? Um, because of the reimagine process, um, this is going to be included in their scope. And so really our recommendations are questions um, specifically for the reimagine group. And so if you reference that in the packet, um, you could see how, you know, we're kind of talking about um, not only the importance of right sizing, um, geographic boundaries, but also just making sure that, um, you know, we have innovative options for micro, micro mobility um, that RTD is considering for communities that, you know, don't really have a fixed route, you know, where are we kind of meeting needs um, still in communities that don't have, you know, fixed routes, especially if they're on the edge of the, the boundary, you know, what, what makes sense, um, what kind of services make sense specifically for those communities. And so um, we outlined some of those questions to go for discussion for the um, reimagine group. And so um, we're hoping that, you know, that work can, can continue through that, that group. Um, and then other than that, we started our conversation on our last meeting um, about board structure. Um, and we did have a presentation from the consultants on that. Um, and that is, it, we're, we're under a tight timeline now, but um, I'm really interested to see how our next conversation is going to go about that. We want to try and obviously um, come together with some recommendations um, very quickly because of our timeline, um, but it's it's been a great conversation so far. So we'll, we'll continue that, and that will most likely be the final recommendations coming from the governance subcommittee. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Julie. Okay, um, Daya, are you able to give, uh, okay, wonderful. I'll pass the mic on to you. Um, so for the operations committee, we wanted to share that, um, again, to echo Brett's earlier point, there are several recommendations that are coming out of joint committees. Um, and so the operations committee had an opportunity to review the draft partnership recommendation. We are in support of the recommendation that the governance subcommittee is moving forward. Um, in addition to that report, there are two additional recommendations that the operations committee is moving forward. As Rhett mentioned earlier, the dashboard, um, which is included within your packet, which outlines um, some of the metrics and objectives that we will be proposing um, for RTD to consider. So that is in your packet and for questions as well. The other recommendation that's included in the packet is around fares and passes. Again, in recognition that RTD is also launching their fair study, this committee um, is proposing these as recommendations that really build on our work that um, for those in, in the community um, know really built on work that we started back in December, which started with a fair framework, F-A-R-E framework, um, fair administration, fair box recovery, um, and really kind of landed us to where we are in terms of that is included in the packet. Thank you, Dea. Um, I'm gonna pause. I think we have a little bit of time um, to see if there's any committee comments um, at this point. Okay. Alisa, I see you on mute. Well, just a, a committee comments on any of the specific recommendations that are going forward or? Yes, yes, on this particular particular agenda item. Gotcha. No, I, I'm good. All right. Uh, yes, Lynn. Thanks. Uh, is this, are, are we talking about the performance metrics separately? Or I saw the, the whole presentation was in the packet. Or is this where I would comment? I think so. I think that's, um, yeah, I think this would be an opportunity to comment on that. Yeah, and I apologize. I was late to the account of the, uh, 
operations committee, I know that maybe some of this was said, but um, uh, you know, we are in the middle of a strategic planning process and um, Deborah Johnson and her staff are setting up two half day workshops where we get to meet in person, uh, masked and separated and hopefully all vaccinated uh, both in June. So we're moving forward um, heavily on that. And uh, that's really where the, the key performance indicators will be coming from, I think. And I think your comments, you know, there's certainly uh, something that we'll look at and, and uh, could be helpful. So, some are ap very applicable, others, uh, you know, the, the, some of the, for instance, I'll say the escalators and elevators. Um, the only escalator, uh, and I'm sure we have others, but the only one I know of that we have is Union Station. And um, so it's not really something that applies well to us. Um, I'll give you another example. The partnerships, I think the recommendation is how many presentations RTD does. And this board has learned that that's not a great metric. Um, judging activity is, is different from judging success. So I guess I would just warn that, um, that we're deep in this, that uh, Deborah has done, a, a, I think, a really good job of bringing this um, to us and we're working with the, with the staff and we'll be moving forward. But some of these, you know, even electrification, we're all, this is a conversation that's coming up repeatedly on the board and among staff, but there are a lot of complexities to electrifying the buses and, and having the, um, the wherewithal to manage them and handle them and, and, uh, and those things. So it's just a, a kind of an overall comment that um, thank you, but there are probably some that we would accept and some that we won't. Thank you, Lynn, for your candor. I think that is just really, I think, appreciated um, as we just kind of go back and forth. Um, and for your comments. Um, did anyone else have comments? Yes, Elise. I guess based on that, I, I would hope that we continue to tweak and fine tune our recommendations before we go through the process. We're also collecting public input and presumably we're not just collecting input to hear people, we're actually gonna cause us to change our recommendations. Lynn just made a couple of key points that I would like to not lose because I think maybe we need to refine our metrics going forward at, if we find out that some of them are, are going to be ineffectual. So um, I just I guess want to clarify for everybody the expectation that nothing is set in stone. Let's continue to to keep track of um, good suggestions that may we may want to reflect in edits and um, prepare to, to see some um, changes as we go through the process. And I, I'm saying that to any public listening on the phone too. We're, we're, these are the draft final, not the final recommendations. So um, I think that's helpful clarification. And Lynn, thanks for those useful comments. Dea, did I see you on mute? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Elise actually just stated what I was going to say, that these are very much draft. Um, North Highland is still taking the feedback from the committee or from the subcommittee, I should say. The purpose of today was to, again, as a full committee, have everyone's eyes on this, recognizing we all sit on multiple subcommittees. And this is our one opportunity monthly to really get some additional insight. So thank you. Yes, uh, Deborah. Yes, I'm sorry, if I can just, and thank you very much. And I wanna say thank you to um, Chair Jones um, and to Dea as well uh, for those comments and to Director Geisinger. And I would just ask all of you guys, when we think about the metrics and so forth, because Director Geisinger spoke to that as we talked about Ellis being elevator and escalators and things of the like, you know, what are we trying to solve for? I would just put that out to the group and recognizing KPIs are wonderful, but you know, if they're not measuring actually what we need that's indigenous to our region, then they're for not. So um, I think that's important and relative to what she said, managing or measuring activities and you don't yield anything from engagement. People have their screens off and you're not doing anything with it, then what's the point? So I thank you guys for clarifying that they're in draft and, and, and appreciate us working collaboratively so we can have something that you know yields some, some great success outcomes for us as we manage the activities to get us there. Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, there's a comment in the chat. Um, is the relevant document the North Highland presentation in the packet? Um, yeah, I mean the the presentation is in the packet. I'm. Are you? Could you clarify that question a little bit? Sorry, I was just, we've been referring to a document, and I just want to make sure I had the right thing pulled up. Okay, yes. The PowerPoint, okay. Yeah, thank you, Dea. Um, I think it's the most recent presentation from the operations subcommittee that's included in this packet. Okay, um, any other comments, thoughts before we move on? Great, awesome, and thank you for that additional feedback. Um, our next agenda item is a discussion of next steps after the final report is submitted, and I believe Doug is gonna lead that conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I, the, um, we have a weekly, or sorry, a monthly meeting with the co-chairs and the uh, subcommittee chairs um, just to set agenda for this full meeting and all the, and the like. And part of that conversation, um, there was a discussion about next steps after the report is submitted um, to the stakeholders on or before July 1st. Uh, well, first I should note that we do have two scheduled meetings in July, or sorry, in June, June 14th and June 28th. So we wanna make sure we get those on your calendar. Um, so there was a conversation in the scope th that was drafted by the, uh, the stakeholders that developed this accountability committee. Um, RTD, the, the memo is wrong. It says 30 days. RT, RTD actually has 45 days um, uh, to, you know, of the issuance of the report to either adopt the recommendations or issue a report stating the reasons for not adopting specific recommendations. And the discussion occurred amongst the, the parties that day that uh, there was interest in possibly having a meeting of the uh, RTD Accountability Committee after that 45 days, sometime after that 45 days, just to have a conversation with RTD about which recommendations they accepted, once they did not, and just have a, an, open in, in, um, um, well, an open dialogue with RTD. So that's really kind of the nutshell of uh, the summary of, of the conversation. I'll just throw it over to the group for discussion. Um, I just, uh, thank you, Doug. Um, I, I will just, you know, I think it's a pretty straightforward kind of request. Um, I'd love to hear uh, from the group if there's any concerns or pain points in potentially setting that up that would potentially mean an additional meeting um, after we've kind of wrapped things up. But I, I do think it'll be meaningful to just, you know, instead of just go give, being given a report, having the opportunity, opportunity to dialogue about it, I think always goes better than, you know, more communication than less. And especially if we aren't going to, I guess, reconvene after that, it's, um, it would feel almost like a cliffhanger, like here are recommendations, here are the responses. And then, you know, I, I do think there's some potential good dialogue there. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, Deborah, did you wanna chime in at some point as well? Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. No, I think that's spot on. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you, uh, Doug, for clarifying the 45 days. I, I think this charts the course for us, managing all of our expectations. And I just appreciate the uh, open and earnest dialogue. Thanks. Daya has her hand up. Oh, oh. yes, Daya, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> No, you're fine. Thanks. Um, thanks, Elise. Thanks, Crystal. I just want to share. I I do think it's important that we reconvene this committee, you know, at that 40, 45 day mark again, just to get an update to Crystal's point. Um, you know, it, it's important that we don't leave this kind of as a cliffhanger and and not have kind of this more final conversation on what implementation might look like for aspects of the recommendation. I also just want to reiterate, I think an earlier comment um, that these public com or these, these 
these convenings, these like strategic conversations tend to happen and they happen in a vacuum for 18 days, or 18 months, sorry, not 18 days, um, 24 months. And so I think to the public, um, there's there's a, a little bit of a duty to also just report out, um, I, especially for our community advocates and those that have been participating in these meetings in a, in a pretty regular basis, just for them to have that level of accountability, which gets back to the central theme of this committee, which is around trust and rebuilding trust with communities. So I think that's a great suggestion. Um, I, a question that I have is, I'm assuming that this would be an op open to the public um, gathering, but I just want to confirm that so that folks can, again, keep an eye out for that calendar invite if you want it. Uh, I believe that would be the case. Doug, did you want to? Yes. Yes, Madam Chair, that would be my expectation. Okay. Elise? I was just going to add, I, I, I totally support this idea, and I think we might even want to invite, you know, the, the, um, creators of this committee to join with us. I think there will be a desire to really dialogue directly with RGD, um, it, you know, if and when some of the ideas aren't, aren't taken up, why, what's gonna happen instead, um, to really ha have an honest and open dialogue would be very helpful, particularly after, you know, the year investment we've put into this and, uh, you know, the, the, the joint conversation we've had with RTD the entire time. Um, I think that that would be an appropriate sort of capstone on the, the, um, this process. And I imagine the governor's office and the, the legislators that created this committee were, are gonna be using that as the stepping stone for you know, what additional happens after that, if anything. And I would also just add in other experiences that I've had the potential of using a uh, facilitator that way you know folks who we really want to be focusing on the content of the conversation aren't so much managing um, you know how the conversation flows you know of course I'd be happy to support and I know co-chair Jones would likely be uh, you know able to do that as well uh, just offering that as a food for thought just to kind of again in the the nature and spirit of conversation and dialogue um, might be helpful for us to, to have a, a third party facilitator. Which isn't something that we had talked about initially, just uh, trying to learn from past experiences, y'all, <laughs> and hopefully make it a productive conversation. Not that it wouldn't be either way, but um, it doesn't sound like we need to necessarily decide that today we have some time uh, so um, if there aren't, I'll, I will pause one more time to see if there's any other thoughts on the matter. Um, and then if not, move on and circle back at a later time. Great, awesome, thank you all. Alrighty, we have some administrative items. Um, in the packet attachment D, there is a uh, draft letter or a letter, excuse me, that uh, was sent regarding the uh, transportation funding proposal. Is that, um, Elise, are you going to be covering that item? It, there's no um, facilitator listed or is that a Doug, Dr. I can, I can do that. Um, that, as you recall, was the, that's a final copy for your records of the letter that the committee sent with regards to promoting um, a greater share of multimodal funding in the big transportation funding package. Um, I'm happy to report that our voice was not alone in pushing for that and that there was a response from bill sponsors in the administration on sweetening the multimodal pot. And those conversations, uh, the bill was um, released last week. It's Senate Bill 260. It comes up this afternoon in its first hearing. Um, and I think there'll be some ongoing dialogue about even potential further tweaks with regards to multimodal funding. But um, I think a lot of the different parties working on the bill are reaching a, a positive conclusion about the bill's um, impact. And while it wouldn't result in direct disbursements to RGD, it would greatly increase the amount of funding going to transit um, across the state and enable local governments and others and CDOT to um, put forward transportation projects um, that will directly um, 
integrate with and I impact RTD's transit system. So I think um, our work on that effort, effort was, was positive and helpful. So just wanted to tie a bow on that and thank everybody for their heavy lifting and a pretty short amount of time to, to fine tune that letter. Thank you, Co-Chair Jones. Um, and thank you for your work on um, helping us, you know, just think creatively at how our voice can be impactful as an RTD accountability committee um, and uh, kind of leading the charge on, on that conversation. So thank you. And we appreciate the dialogue internally and being able to add comments and edits as well. And we are transitioning out of that update into just general member comments and other, other matters uh, for our discussion. Okay. Alrighty, I'm not seeing any. Um, Doug, I will just wait one second. To, did you have anything you wanted from a Dr. Cog perspective wanted to add before we wrap up? I might just mention again the upcoming meetings. Um, so again, so we're, we're looking at two meetings in, ju in June, um, June 14th. And at that time, we anticipate uh, bringing forth the final recommendations from the subcommittee for your, for your action. And then on the July, on June, God, I keep saying July, on June 28th meeting, the expectation is that you guys will ratify the final report and then we'll get that sent off to the stakeholders. Thank you. Yes, Rebecca. I believe that at one point kind of early in this process, we talked about um, having a, a more quote unquote public meeting uh, where we would sort of open it up and you guys are nodding. <laughs> Is there a plan for that? And I've just missed that. Yeah, uh, Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're, we're we're currently anticipating having a public hearing. Hearing, yeah. At the June 14th meeting. At the 14th, okay. In addition, oh, in addition to that, uh, we will also be uh, having, um, uh, conducting surveys on the uh, draft final recommendations. Just to clarify that, I mean, so, it's, so we are doing some public outreach um, and, and seeking public input into the recommendation. We're using, what's the, what's the platform, Matthew? I don't remember the name of the platform, but it's the one we use. <laughs> Something points, I believe, or points. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Could we clarify, will that, the outreach and, and public input, input collected online will be available to us before that public hearing or before we ratify? Yes, that's correct. That time frame. And actually, how about further clarification? So will we take action um, on June 14th or will we be strictly listening and then take final action on the 28th? Well, that's a great question, Elise. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll throw it back to you guys and ask you that question, what, what your desire might be. Well, this is sort of off the cuff because I hadn't th thought it through. I think um, it might be useful to, it, at the end of the public hearing to, for uh, board members to give reactions on if they anticipate um, wanting to make any amendments so that everybody can be prepared and, and thinking so that the June 28th ratification process goes smoothly. Um, I don't think we have to, obviously you can't hear public comment and immediately turn it around potentially for an amendment, but you can say, listen, I was persuaded that so-and-so made this point and I think we should consider whether or not we wanna adopt an edit to that effect in the final version. And then we could deal with that two weeks later. Yeah, Lisa, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, quite frankly. And as you know, as a former Dr. Cog board member yourself, I mean, typically when we had public hearings, um, we did not act on the same evening. So maybe we, we do that. We have the public hearing, we have the draft recommendations in place, and that then provides staff enough time to modify the recommendations in the final report for your ratification um, once we hear the public comments. That's a great suggestion, Elise. Uh, Rut, 
The one thing I, I wanted to note was we may need a longer meeting for that meeting. We may need more than just an hour and a half. It, it sounds like something that we need to at least anticipate if there's a, a good robust discussion from, you know, from the public, then we need to give them the flexibility to really be able to be heard. We got to come for long meetings, but sometimes they may be necessary. So should we I mean, I guess we, should we plan on a two hour long meeting? I mean, that's. We can, we can do that, Madam Co-Chair. Okay. Miss Shirley, that'd be awesome too. Okay, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, just, just so I understand. So the, there will be public input sought sort of electronically prior to the 14th. Does that mean this committee should be looking for that um, a, a, a write-up of the final recommendations prior to that so that we kind of know what's going out publicly then? But the 14th is the actual public hearing. So I think it'll be multiple points for the ways for the public to reach us. So we need to come to the 14th with an open mind to hear the verbal feedback in addition to having digested the online feedback. Yeah, Rebecca, if I may, also, you're, you're right. You, you will receive some formal um, documentation on what the recommendations are that are coming out of the subcommittees. Now, what you see in your packet today, for the most part, are, are recommendations that are, you know, that have been vetted by the subcommittee mm -hmm. are still that are out couple that are outstanding, of course, the finance committee, for example, um, governance committee has one more that may or may not yield uh, recommendations. So we will package that up. And then we also want to do, of course, the equity assessment. That's why we're finishing our subcommittee work on the 19th. It provides enough time to do those equity assessments and then finalize those and get those to you all and get it through our you know, social process uh, with regards to socializing those recommendations for public comment. But, but you will receive that probably by the end of May, Matthew, those recommendations. I think so. Yeah, that'll give two weeks of public comment and then a, the culminate at a public hearing on the 14th. Got it. We'll report. Okay. So Doug, Chris and I will, I'll call on you in just a second, but just want to clarify, um, we'll get the final, you know, as final as possible recommendations from the subcommittee end of May um, so that there is two weeks uh, for uh, public comment. When will we get the I guess um, the public comment, virtual, you know, electronic public comment, so that we might be able to review before the 14th. That's a great. The timeline is getting getting pretty. <laughs> All right. Um, so we can, you know, we can provide those to you right up until you know 24 hours before the meeting for sure, right? Um, so maybe it's a situation in which you know we provide you with. Um, we give you just active updates when we receive those, and then you know we'll package the whole thing then for the meeting. Um, I'm I'm thinking on the run here right now. Um, see what that looks like. That's yeah. Thank you. And that maybe that's uh, something to massage. I just maybe we could cut off public comment by the tenth. I mean, I don't want to cut off the ability for people to comment because of course we have an email that's always open. But just, um, I want everyone to feel prepared that they've had an opportunity to review. If, if it works better to kind of give ongoing updates, definitely don't want to squash that idea either. But um, maybe just the time certain could be helpful as well. Yeah, I will tell you, Crystal, that typically what we've done, at least at Dr. Cog, for, for our, um, um, our items that require public hearings or that we do public hearings on, is that the public comment period runs right up until the public hearing. So um, we provide actually a full package of public comments that we received on the night of that meeting. But we will, we can give you what we have to go out in the packet and then any additional comments we get, 
than we provide to you that night. Because you're because as we talked, it doesn't sound like we're going to vote on those recommendations that evening anyway. So you will have those to be able to prepare for the, your vote on the on the 28th. Yeah, actually, you make a really good point. Um, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, Kristen and then Rutt. How will Dr. Cog seek the public comment? Will there be, uh, will you send out emails? Will there be um, advertising of some kind? Yes, and I wish our public engagement specialist was on the line, um, but she would tell you that we will use all, all means in order to do that. We will obviously, we have a pretty large database of, uh, of email uh, that we will send to. We'll also advertise via social media um, through this one online application that we have, Social Point or something like that, that we'll, we will also utilize. Um, and of course, you know, we'll send you all the link that you can then share with your with your, um, you know, your partners and stakeholders that you you utilize as well. Excellent, thank you. Right. Since we're really getting down to the wire on this, I think it would be useful for Dr. Cog to produce a, a schedule and say, this is what we're planning to do. These are the deadlines that we're facing. We've talked about it a lot, but it's it's good to have that basically where you can keep referring back to it. And I think it's useful, not just for the co-committee chairs or subcommittee chairs, but really for everybody on the committee to be able to have access to that. Is that something we think uh, we can produce? Okay. Yeah, definitely, yep. Great, sorry, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. I saw no, the head nod. <laughs> All righty. Um, any, we have three minutes, y'all. Any other thoughts, comments? No? Okay, wonderful. Alrighty, thank you all so much uh, for your time and we will reconvene soon. Thank you all. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks.